All right, I'm good. Uh, if you have been to Walmart recently, maybe you will have noticed that school's about to start. We're, uh, we're winding down our summer break, and uh, school's starting back up. We're moving out of one season, this uh, season of kind of a go, 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 and, and uh, trying to get in all your vacations and sports events and uh, you know, all the running around that we do during summer, and that's soon to be replaced by the structured routine of the school year. And so we kind of find ourselves standing here looking forward to that. And even if you're not affected by the school year, uh, a lot of us uh, are kind of paying attention to the seasons, crossing our fingers. Hopefully summer's starting to wind down. We're going to be able to open up our windows soon and get a nice fresh breeze through the house. And uh, before long, pumpkin spice is going to be everywhere. And so we're, you know, whether or not uh, it's school, we're all affected by different seasons and different phases of life. And so today, as we kind of stand on the back end of summer, as we stand on, on the closing of summer break and we're looking forward to the next season that's coming up, I want to take just a moment and look back, look way back uh, to a time when Israel was also standing at the close of one phase of life and looking forward to the next season. So I invite you to turn with me to the book of Deuteronomy. And we're going to be reading uh, here in just a little bit from, from the book of Deuteronomy. So this morning I've kind of broken the sermon up into two parts. Uh, a look back and a look forward. And, and for the second part, we're going to zoom in and look at a particular passage. And we're going to kind of see exactly what Moses is saying here. But for the first part... Uh, my selected passage is the whole book of Deuteronomy. So if you'd like me to read my selected passage, uh, Deuteronomy takes about an hour and a half to read, and I'd do that, but I don't want to be stoned in the parking lot after church. So we're going to just rely on more of a general understanding of what Moses is trying to do here in this book. Um, before we even dig into this, I want to back up just a little further in the history of, of Israel to kind of see where the Israelites are at this time. Uh, geographically, they are standing on the east side of the Jordan River, but I want to talk about where they are as a nation, kind of what they've been through and, and what, they've, what has brought them to where they are. So they've spent hundreds of years as slaves in Egypt where they were steeped in and participated in polytheism. You know, obviously Egypt was a very polytheistic culture. They worshipped uh, many, many gods. And after generation and generation and generation of Israelites born and surrounded by that, they took that on. Uh, Joshua will even say later in the book of Joshua, he'll say, put away the gods that you worship, or that your fathers worshipped across the river and in Egypt. Israel became polytheistic being li uh, living in and being surrounded by that culture. And God, He went in and He broke Egypt and He brought His children out. And He led them to the banks of Jordan. Along the way, they stopped for a couple of years at Mount Sinai, Sinai where God gave them the commands and reestablished His covenant. But now, uh, the children of Israel are standing on the banks of Jordan River and they are not faithful enough in just one true God to defeat their giants and, and, and go up against fortified cities. They are not faithful to enter the land of Canaan, so God leads them back out to the wilderness. That generation has to pass away. And it's the next generation, the generation who had spent their whole lives as nomads that come back to the banks of Old Jordan, and now they are where we're at this morning. They're standing on one side, Closing out a chapter of nomadic life, looking forward to the next season. Soon they wouldn't be nomads anymore. They would be settling in houses and cities. Soon they wouldn't be gathering uh, their food from the ground. They would be planting fields. And so as they stood there on the shore, Moses had some parting words to remind them and prepare them for what's next. So, uh, you know, the book of Deuteronomy... Uh, is written right at the end of Moses' life. They've already been through all the wandering of the desert and, and have already received all the law. And this is uh, literally, they're back on the east side of the Jordan where they were 38 years later. 
and Moses is retelling them everything. This is Deuteronomy. So if you, if you know what a duet is, like Sonny and Cher, the duet is two people. This is duet Eronomy. This is the second time that Moses is saying this because, you know, kids, you have to tell them over and over. So this is the second time. And um, for those of us who have had kids uh, or you know, have kids currently, if you've ever had them, and you've ever taken them to a store, and you've probably at some point given them a pep talk. And you, you take them and you say, okay, now we're about to go into the store. You remember last time we were here, and you ran off and started chewing on the socks in the clothing department. We're not going to do that this time, right? Okay? Did you learn from last time? Did you learn that? Okay, we're not going to do that this time. And then maybe you even kind of, you know, every parent lays down the ultimatum. Listen, if... If you will be good, if you will not pester your sister, if you will not ask me to buy you, uh, you know, 20 items, if you will not touch every single thing in the store, then I will buy you a candy bar when we get to the checkout, okay? I I will bless you with that. If you will be good, there's blessing. But if you're not, okay, if you uh, scream and cry and fuss and throw a fit, and if you... Uh, you know, pester your sister, and if you test to see if that item on the shelf really is made of glass, then I will take you out of the store and I will bust your tail. So there's either a candy bar or there's a sore bottom. It is your choice. Okay? If you've ever done that, then you can step right into the shoes of Moses because that's exactly what he's doing here in Deuteronomy. He reminds them of God's promise for blessing and for curse. And he says it is your choice. You can either follow and be blessed or you can be disobedient and be cursed. But he's also reminding them of the last time. Remember the last time you were here. And then remember all the things that your God has done along the way, the hard times in the desert, the the 40 years of wondering, and how that has prepared you leading up to this point. You see, you know, the Israel that came out of Egypt, the, the polytheistic Israel that came out, was about to go right back into another land that was very polytheistic. Canaan, uh, you know, they worshiped Baal and Asherah poles and, and sacrificed to Molech and dozens of other gods. And they, they were not ready to handle that. It took 40 years to reshape a generation of Israelites. It took 40 years of waking up each morning and relying on God's providence to find food on the ground. It took 40 years of listening for God and following His instructions to whether we pack up our tents and move today or if we stay put. It took 40 years of seeing people actually rebel against God and fire coming down from the sky and consuming them or the ground opening up and and swallowing them or snakes biting them. It took 40 years of, of... seeing that firsthand to transform a nation to now come back to the shores of Jordan and be ready to follow God faithfully as he leads them into this promised land. And Moses reminds them, remind them, reminds them see these hard times and how they were to prepare you for this. Sometimes as we are preparing for the next phase, it's good for us to look back and see how God has been at work. You know, we, uh, we say that hindsight is twenty twenty, And that's mostly true, not entirely, because even after the fact, we still don't have a clear picture of everything, not like God does. But we have a much better picture than we're, when we're in the moment. You know, when we're in the moment, we can't always see all the factors going on. We can't see the end result. But now, looking back, we have a better picture. Uh, I am well removed from college now. And so I can look back on my tenure in college and see that there were a lot of other things going on that had effect that I didn't know at the time. I, uh, I kind of cruised through college. I really didn't put a lot of effort into it. As a result, I, I made mostly B's and C's. I had a few A's here and there for the easy classes. I had a couple of F's. I failed calculus. Um, To this day, if you ask me to find the area under a curve, I will gladly draw you a picture of a tree. So I've failed calculus. That's not my thing. But when I look back now, and I see how my apathy towards my studies and how that affected life later on, 
uh, later, years later, I went in for a master's degree. And having that experience and being able to look and see all the effects that this had, I did much better in my master's program. I made straight A's because of the experience and because I was able to look back on that time and see. Um, just, uh, I guess about a week ago, I was talking with one of the young men in the youth group who's going into his senior year of high school. And I, I told him, as I tell all graduating seniors, fill out every application you can for scholarships. That's something I did not do in my senior year of high school. It just, I don't know why I didn't see it as free money. People just handing out free money here. Fill out this application, write an essay. We'll give you five grand. If somebody did that today, I'd be back in an hour with everything filled out. But I didn't make the connection of the cost of school, the cost of my college. It just didn't connect. It connected with me very hard about three months after I graduated. And I got a letter in the mail saying, hey, you know that 50 grand you borrowed? We would like 70 grand of that back. And then I was able to look back, look back and be like, oh, okay. So then I paid for 15 years on that five years of college. And so now being able to look back and see the results and see the bigger picture, I am more than happy to try and pass on to future generations, fill out those scholarships. You don't understand what that is. That's just, it's, thank you, 17-year-old Sean, for setting me up for 15 years of payment. And as I got that first bill, and I was like, this is more than I even make each month. It's crazy. So, um, you know, Moses, he's doing the same thing. He says, remember, remember how the Lord your God brought you out of Egypt. Remember how he defeated King Og and King Sion for you. Remember, remember these things because now that you're removed from it, now that we're back to where we started, you have a bigger picture idea you can see. And, you know, for us today, that's, that's what we do is uh, we look back and it's hard to see how God is at work in the moment. Sometimes, you know, if I were to ask everybody, you know, how is God working in your life specifically this morning, Sunday morning? How is God working specifically? A lot of us may have a, a hard time confidently saying, well, God is powerfully doing this right now. We, we may not see it in the moment, but when I look back and I see that, uh, you know, I, I said I failed math, but I can do this formula. I see that a long time ago, I could not see in the moment how God was working. But when I look back, I see, oh man, yeah, actually God was working powerfully, specifically doing these things, even though I couldn't see it. So I apply that formula to today that I may still not be able to see how God is working, but I know that he is because I know that he was. I know that he was working, preparing me for this moment. And so I know that now he's also preparing me right now for what's to come. <clears throat> I've, uh, I've told you all, uh, the story of how I came to ministry um, before, uh, how uh, when I was much younger, I, had, I was not going to be a minister. It was not on my radar. Was, I, was, I wouldn't say I was against it, but it was, it was not for me. I knew I was not going to be a minister, but yet here I am today. And I'm not going to bore you with that story again, but I do want to point out how neat it is to be able to look back over years and see how God has shaped different parts of my life and put them together like a jigsaw puzzle. How he's taken, you know, my, my work as a graphic designer and my interest in the outdoors and sports and, and work I did at children's homes and, and my love for movies and video games and a hundred other quirks and interests and, and experiences that he's brought them all together uniquely to make this very neat picture of me in preparation to serve him. And Moses does the same thing with Israel. He says, Look, at, look back over everything. Look at how God brought you out of Egypt and, and prepared you this way. Look how uh, he gave you the law and you agreed to it. Look how, he, how you complained at the uh, Jordan River and how you lost the uh, promised land there. Remember how you wandered through the wilderness uh, eating bread off the ground and drinking water from rocks. And remember how uh, when you rebelled, you got bitten by snakes. Remember all these things. Look at all these pieces and how now they come together to form this picture of, a, of an Israel that has been disciplined and is ready to move forward 
with God at the head. Moses helped them look back on the journey so far and how God has been at work with them the whole way. And now Israelite stands on the shore looking forward to what lies ahead. And Moses further prepared them by reminding them how they are to proceed from there. Um, so go ahead and turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 33, and we're going to read into chapter 6. So again, Moses has reminded them of how God has prepared them using the experiences of the past, how he's prepared them to this point, and now he's going to show them how God has prepared them by providing them with direction. Deuteronomy chapter 5, starting in verse 33. You shall walk in all the way that the Lord your God has commanded you, that you may live, and that it may go well with you, and that you may live long in the land that you shall possess. Now this is the commandment, the statutes and the rules that the Lord your God commanded me to teach you. Hang on, put a pin in it. We still have more to read, but I want to I point something out before we go on so that you can kind of have this in mind and look for this in our reading. There's two things going on right here. Uh, first of all, I want you to notice how God wants His people to be blessed. He says, that, you know, do these things so that you may live, and so that it will go uh, well for you, and that you may live long. God desires for His children to be blessed. God is not limited in His ability to bless His children. He's, not, it's never, he's never going to run out of blessing, and He longs to share that with His children. He wants good things for them. He wants, he desires for us to be blessed. And I just think that's neat to see. He, it's almost like, you know, I want my kids to have a good life and I almost kind of want it more than they do sometimes. I want when, it, when we go into the store, I want them to be good so that I can buy them the candy bar. Nothing would make me happier to buy them the treat because of good behavior. I want that for them just like God wants good things for us. But also notice, uh, he mentions here about the commandments and the statutes and the rules. So, uh, chapter 5, verse 33, where he's talking about the blessing, this forms a sandwich. And whenever there's a sandwich, I like to pay attention to it in the Bible. The first part of chapter 5, he restates the Ten Commandments. If you back up just a little bit, you see he restates the thou shalts. And so he goes through the Ten Commandments. Then he talks about God desiring his children to be blessed. And now he's right back into, now these commandments and these statutes and these rules. Whenever there's a sandwich like that, that means there's a connection. There is a connection between the blessing of God and the commandments of God. And so I want you to have that in mind as we continue reading for a few more verses. So I already read, uh, now this is the commandment, the statutes and the rules that the Lord your God commanded me to teach you, that you may do them in the land to which you are going over, to possess it, that you may fear the Lord your God, you and your son and your son's son, by keeping all the statutes and commandments which I command you all the days of your life, and that your days may be long. If you're an underliner, verse three is a, the first part of verse 3 is a very good one to underline. Hear therefore, O Israel, and be careful to do them, that it may go well with you, and that you may multiply greatly as the Lord, the God of your fathers, has promised you, in a land flowing with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on your doorposts of your house and on your gates. God wants His children to be blessed and to live in His blessing. But in order to do that, they must follow his commands. You see, uh, the blessings of God and the commands of God are not separate things like, 
Um, suppose, it's not like, okay, God says, if you will follow my commands, then come to me and I will pay you a blessing. Similar to if I had a, a pile of wood at my house and I, I told somebody, if you'll come stack this up for me, then I will pay you $10. There's no connection between those things other than just the agreement that if you will do this, then I will do this. God is saying, you know, that verse I told you to underline, chapter 6, verse 3, you know, be careful to do them that it may go well with you. The blessings of God come from the commandments of God. He says, don't steal and don't murder and don't commit adultery. Yes, those are harmful to other people, but they're, they're damaging to the perpetrator. They're damaging to their soul, and it, it separates you from God. You know, it's, it's almost like if you imagine a box right here. All, you know, God's blessing is right here in this box, and the boundary of the box is God's commandments. That's what holds in His blessing. When we stay within God's commandments, we stay within blessing. And we're going to see later, I mean, we're not going to study it today, but in the book of Judges, the Israelites start leaving God's commandments and they leave God's blessing. It's like um, uh, Ronald Reagan had a famous statement about, uh, well, I didn't leave the Democratic Party. The Democratic Party left me. And God's saying to, to the, uh, His children and judges when they leave, I didn't withdraw my blessing from you. You left my blessing. The commandments form the boundaries for the blessing, they, they make a guardrail. So as the children are moving forward, he's saying, you're moving into a, a, a land filled with polytheism with lots of worldly influence, and I have these commands forming guardrails on your left and on your right. So as you move forward, stay within this, and you're going to, to be blessed. You're going to be safe. You're going to live long, and it will go well with you if you stay here, because this is where the blessing is. Once you start hopping over the guardrail, you're going to be eaten up with the worldly influences. The commands of God were to prepare them to be holy in the midst of a worldly society. And so they're supposed to follow these commands, supposed to take these commands and teach them diligently to their children so that their kids may also have that same blessing as them are we prepared or are we preparing for a new upcoming season by writing god's word on our hearts and are we teaching it diligently to our children see god he gives himself to us full unrestrained unrestricted relationship with god and eternal life our blessings that we receive from Him. But in order to have that, we must obey the Word of God. Um, John, the Apostle John, in his Gospel, he records Jesus making this same connection between obedience and blessing. John uh, 3.36, Whomever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. John 14, 15, if you love me, you will keep my commands. John 15, 10, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. He keeps tying this together that blessing comes from obedience. They're not separated things. Following God's commandments inherently leads to a blessed life, an eternal life, a life in relationship with God. And although we don't live under the old law, the commandments that we observe today still serve the same purpose. To guard our hearts and our minds from the dangers and harmful things of this world and to transform us to be the likeness of Christ. Are we preparing ourselves to live in a land that surrounds us with worldly influence as we move forward? Are we teaching these commands, these words of God, diligently to our children? Are we talking about them when we sit around the house and when we travel, each morning when we get up and each night when we go to bed? Are you daily in the Word? Are you allowing God to prepare you for the next season? Psalm 1 1, I'm, I'm starting to kind of wind down here. Psalm 1-1 in verse 2 says, Blessed is the man 
who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked or stand in the way of sinners or sit in the seat of mockers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. Blessed is the man whose delight is in the law of the Lord, because the law of the Lord, the word of God, brings blessing. As we enter this new season, here's what I would have to say to us as we enter. Walk in all the way that the Lord your God has commanded you, that you may live, and that it may go well with you, and that you may live long in the land that you shall possess. And teach the word of God diligently to your children. One of my favorite verses uh, in the Bible is Malachi 3.10 where God says, test me in this and see if I don't throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing you won't have enough room to store it. The context of that is Israel had stopped following the commands of God. And nor, you know, normally we say, thou shalt not put the Lord your God to test. You know, that's actually in there somewhere. I don't remember the actual verse. But it does say not to test the Lord your God. But here he says, if you want to test me, do this. Follow what I've said to do and see if it doesn't work out. See if you're not just blessed on top of blessing on top of blessing. Do what I've said. Know the word of God and live it and see if it doesn't work out for you. He says, I guarantee it will. I will throw open the floodgates of heaven. And that just, that's just a, I love that because it's such a cool verse to think about how powerful God is. He is unlimited in his blessing. And he's like, I will pour it out. You know, think about the rains that we had just in the past couple of days and how heavy and strong they would get. And that's God saying, I will pour it out if you will just obey the commands that I've given you. This church wants to help you prepare for the next season. We want to help you recognize how God has always been at work in your life. And we want to help you put the Word of God on your heart to help guide you as you move forward. So if there is anything this church can do for you, won't you please come as we stand and sing?